So chapter seven is uh, is actually a, a chapter that reflects on cash, but I would say the most important part of chapter seven for you to understand, uh, not just in accounting, but in business are the issues of fraud and what is called internal controls that businesses have. So we're gonna be focused on that um, and it should be interesting. In terms of what we're gonna be doing in chapter seven, uh, just the first two learning objectives are, um, are emphasized here, okay? Okay, so let us get started here with our understanding of fraud. Now fraud, you know, this is a, a narrow definition uh, that's applied to this chapter here. So just take it, fraud is a lot more than what this is, <laughs> um, but this is the definition we're using. So it's a dishonest act, again, here by an employee, right? That will gain some, to have some personal gain, but at the expense of the employer. Okay, so that's how we're narrowly defining fraud here. A dishonest act by employee for their gain, but at the cost of the employer. In order for fraud to happen, um, three factors sort of come into mind. Uh, one starts at the very, very top, and that's opportunity. Now, what they mean by this is, um, employees handle corporate assets. The most vulnerable corporate asset employees handle is cash. And you've probably, you might've had that experience. You might've been gotten hired as a cashier at some point in your life. You might've gotten hired in another capacity where you actually handle cash. <clears throat> That's an asset to the company. Um, it's a very vulnerable asset as you'll see. You might also work at a company that you actually get to handle other assets like inventory of the company <clears throat> or supplies for the company. Um, that's what it's mean by opportunity. First, you have to have the opportunity to have access to and handle various assets that the, corp that the cor corporation owns. The second factor, I'll go down to the left, is financial pressures. And Again, from a personal perspective, we all have financial pressures. I mean, that's part of life, right? Um, but in addition to the, we have a high cost of living. We live in an area where rents uh, and mortgages are expensive, cost of housing, cost of transportation is expensive, food, healthcare, other types of things are costly. Um, then you throw in education, entertainment, other types of things. Uh, it's easy for people to run out of money. And we have a lot of people living paycheck to paycheck today. So we have a lot of people already under a lot of financial pressure just to get the basics done. Then if you could add to that the wonderful uh, addictions we have as human beings, whether that's uh, uh, gambling, uh, shopping for things we don't need because we're just addicted to it. Um, you know, booze, which is alcohol. Uh, drugs, be it legal or illegal, marijuana, um, paying for other types of things that would be, you know, gambling, uh, things that would simply be uh, a habit that costs a lot of money, let's put it that way. Um, and that adds to the financial pressures substantially. So we have two of the cornerstones here, right? people that are exposed to and have the opportunity to handle assets of the employer. And the same folks who are feeling a lot of financial pressure and potentially that's edged up a little bit because of uh, an addiction that they, they may have. And then the last piece of the puzzle where fraud happens is what we call rationalization. And rationalization just basically is convincing yourself that doing the wrong thing is the right thing to do. <laughs> so, you know, you know from kindergarten, you've learned from a young age, do not take things that don't belong to you. I mean, you know, that's one of the first lessons you get at home. Certainly they do that in kindergarten and in elementary school. You know this, 
as a child, you know this as an adult. But the rationalization comes from this idea, well, they're a multi-billion dollar corporation, they're not gonna miss this. That's rationalization. You know, it's still not your property to take, but that rationalization is, makes it okay for you to take it. Um, Another rationalization is, you know, I bust my butt here at work and they promoted, you know, person X over me. And person X doesn't do and know much. I deserve that. And so the next time, you know, this company, you know, next time I handle a whole bunch of cash, some of it's going to go in my pocket because I deserve it. Rationalization, right? Um, so again, uh, when all of these three things come together and are acted upon, that's when fraud happens, okay? Uh, and unfortunately, because employees work for the company, they kind of know a lot. They are actually, again, given the opportunity to handle uh, things as vulnerable as cash and you know, as, as large as inventory and equipment and so forth. So, um, they know how things work, okay? So fraud happens everywhere. It's a sad fact of life. Well, come, come to find out, um, it also happens in accounting <laughs> where um, a lot of businesses in the past, and maybe some today, uh, like to lie and about how good they are doing. Um, they lie to investors, they lie to the public, they, they manipulate financial data to make them look better than they really are. Um, that's also fraud, that's also fraud. And so when this happened in, um, this continues to happen uh, throughout uh, our history as a country, but when you have large corporations that commit this type of thing, Congress finally acted and they passed something called Sarbanes-Oxley Act way back in I don't know, 2001, 2002, 2003. It was pretty early. And that was after a whole bunch of companies who you thought were big, like Enron <laughs> or WorldCom, they basically vanished. They disappeared. Um, and uh, all of it was because of fraud. So Sarbanes-Oxley said, look, it's important that we, we put into law um, certain guidelines that if you fail to meet them, you could go to jail. These uh, laws affect publicly traded corporations, so anything that's traded on the stock market because the public has access to the information. They are required under Sarbanes-Oxley to put in a system of what we call internal controls. Um, which are con control systems that prevent fraud from happening. Okay. Um, they're required to do that. That's a requirement of the law. That's what you're going to be learning a lot about today. Another thing that, that Sarbanes actually did is for the first time, corporate executives and certain members of the board of directors who work on uh, financial issues can go to jail. Okay for deliberately signing off on fraudulent financial information and statements, okay. Um, another thing that the law did is require corporations to hire um, accountants. Now, auditors are basically accountants who review other accountants' work, <laughs> okay. Um, and so uh, the auditors have to be from an independent company who that company does not do business with. Okay. Uh, they have to hire an independent auditing company to come in and take a look at their books to see what their accountants are doing. And if they're following the rules, what rules? GAP, generally accepted accounting principles. That's what you've been learning. Those are the rules. They have to be followed. Uh, if the auditors find that there are um, instances where they're not being followed, they have to write a report up and put that out, okay? So that's very, very important to know. And then of course, uh, every time Congress passes a law, 
they need to create a, a, a mini bureaucracy or a large bureaucracy to enforce it because laws on the books, as you know, all alone don't work. They need to be enforced. And so they created the uh, Public Company Accounting Oversight Board uh, to oversee US publicly traded companies' financial information to make sure that they're following all of these requirements. Now, that being said, let's focus on what companies are doing uh, in terms of internal control, okay? The most important thing as to what they have to do is again, safeguard the assets. The assets of a corporation are owned by the corporation. They are not to be taken by anybody or abused by anybody. They belong to a legal entity, okay? And so that's most important, okay? So most of what you're gonna see in these internal control measures and most of what you might've lived through as you've worked at various places uh, is all in place to safeguard the assets. But internal controls also help to keep those accounting records reliable and accurate. Um, and that's very important because that's what we want. We want information, financial information that is accurate as possible, right? Uh, that's important. What companies have known by actually going over and looking at how they can control things, so fraud cannot be committed, is they've actually been able to increase their efficiency in how they operate. Um, and that's helped businesses run better, believe it or not, okay? Um, and last, they, they have to also make sure that they have people on board, uh, each corporation to make sure that they are in compliance. Uh, so almost all corporations have some type of compliance officer or a compliance office with a lot of people working in it. What do they, what do, they do? They make sure the corporation is, is following the various rules and regulations that are put upon them by Congress or the state. Okay. So again, the most important thing that you need to know about internal controls is corporations have to put them together so they can safeguard their assets most important. So there are uh, pro some primary components we're gonna be looking at uh, regarding internal control. Um, certainly the type of environment uh, that, the, that that's, exists in the company, uh, what type of risks that are there, uh, what activities they have put into place to make sure things are going well and things are more accurate. How are they uh, communicating and informing others that these things are, are happening and how well are our employees and managers following those you know, types of activities? Uh, all important parts of it. So here's some of the things that you might've um, experienced as an employee. One internal control that's really important is establish responsibility. Uh, basically, you want to know who is in charge of a particular activity, who is responsible for a particular activity. Because when something goes wrong, you know exactly who to talk to. Right? Um, so again, effectively, one person should be responsible for a particular given task. Or you want to limit access to ha who has access to certain things. So for example, in your book here, the example uh, of transferring your cash drawer. So one cashier, uh, every cashier is given his or her own cash drawer. So when you start your shift, there's so much cash in the cash drawer. You go to your register, you're working and, and cashing people out and so forth. And then of course, at the end of that shift, um, you're counting that up and it's being, you know, making sure that it's totaled, right? You are responsible for whatever happens in that drawer. And if someone else is coming in, they have their own drawer. It becomes a little bit more tricky when that drawer has access to, almost everybody has access to the drawer. Uh, and that's how it used to be back in the day. Everyone who worked in a place had access to the cash share industry. Um, so today there's a lot of things that they wanna to do to establish responsibility that you are in control of this particular drawer. So it's true at, a, at most retail, uh, uh, supermarkets, other places, banks, of course, with tellers, they all have their, their cash drawer. Almost every 
organization that deals with it will have this type of system in place. Another thing that they do is they try to segregate the duties as best as possible. That's a way, again, it's an internal control activity because it helps them check to see if everything is okay. So what do they mean by segregation of duties? Well, one is you have someone here who actually physically has uh, the cash stored, say, in their register or drawer. And you have another employee who is doing, you know, maintaining the records of that. So this employee sees all the cash sales, et cetera, and has a, has a, has a record of that. But this employee also has the cash. <laughs> they should be able to match because <laughs> both things it should, they should have the same story. <laughs> should have the same amount of cash on hand. So by separating and segregating the duties, you can have more accountability uh, that's built in. Okay. So as, as you know, at the end of a, of a shift, a teller will, will cash out with the head teller or the bank manager, or a cashier will cash out with a supervisor um, or whatever. Someone will make sure everything is, is accounted for. Uh, another thing that's very, very popular, companies use documents. Uh, documents are really a way uh, to control various activities and have a record of what happened. So they can go back and check to see if anything went wrong. Right? So companies need to use these documents to make sure everything is accounted for. Uh, employees need to also use these documents to make sure uh, that they have attested to their portion of it, okay? These documents protect everybody involved because it's sort of a true, excuse me, a truthful statement, okay? You're signing off on, the business is signing off on, et cetera. And of course, a lot of businesses have tons of physical controls uh, that they put out there. Um, one of the most interesting physical controls that a lot of businesses still don't use is the time clock. Okay. Um, because the issue here is can employees steal time? Right? That's stealing as well. When you, when you don't have a time clock and you actually write your own hours in or submit your own hours, uh, who knows, you know, how do you know you're not padding those? Because how's the business know you're not padding those hours? Uh, even if you pad a couple of hours, you're not stealing. You're stealing money away from the company. Um, so time clocks, something where you need to punch in or co put your code in or swipe or whatever, basically provides a record uh, that verifies that you worked that particular amount of time and the company is paying you for what you work for. So that's important. But again, I, I know a lot of companies that still don't use time clocks. Um, they still basically do it like, yeah, you know, okay, yeah, this person was here from here to here and that's what you're getting paid for. Uh, so be it. You probably know that all, all companies, all stores, retail sort of have um, alarms and other types of things that go off when people are trying to get in. Um, very, very important to safeguard, particularly for retail. I mean, inventory is everything. That's what they're selling. So clearly you want all of that to be safeguarded. Um, if you're working at a bank or other types of place where there's a lot of cash, um, you're gonna have a safe, you're gonna have a vault, you're gonna have something where important things are kept. Um, and you're going to want to limit who has access to the safe or to the safety deposit box or the vault, wherever cash is held. So, you know, big cash businesses, this could be restaurants uh, included as well. They collect a lot of cash, bars. Um, you know, where they keep all of that is very, very important. Who has access to that is really important um, because you don't want any of that stuff to get stolen. Right. Uh, you probably know that if you've worked in retail, inventory is tagged, uh, monitored in a lots of different ways. And so um, you have special tags that, you know, kind of explode if you try to <laughs> take it off <laughs> in blue ink and other types of things that don't come off pretty easily. 
Um, plus there are monitors, cameras, every types of systems uh, that are there. Some, um, you know, some stores have uh, wires and other types of things going through various inventory, keep it under lock and key. So these are all ways of controlling, right? Stopping fraud from occurring. Stopping fraud, from, that's an internal control. How do you stop fraud from occurring? Uh, that's a good one as well. Um, certainly getting into a warehouse or getting into uh, where inventory is kept, you wanna make sure those are locked. Um, there's also storage cabinets for inventory. You probably know a lot of supermarkets keep uh, their baby formula, you know, kind of locked up. You have Best Buy and other places that have various pieces of equipment that are behind lock and key. Um, you know, again, all of that is, is meant to stop fraud from occurring. And who has access to the warehouse and to all those goods? Because that's also uh, very important. And then of course, even if you were going to get into some place, whether it's into a warehouse, into a cash register, into something, oftentimes you have to have a passcode, you might have fingerprint uh, ID, something that tells them you were the person who walked in at this time and you were the person who walked out at this time. Right? So, um, and whether that's a code on a cash register or whether it's a, you know, an eyeball scan to get into some place that's, that's pretty unique. Um, all of those are meant to identify people. Um, so if anything was missing, they know who to talk to. You know. uh, a lot of corporations are big enough where you can have something called an independent internal verification. <coughs> Excuse me, so someone inside the corporation who understands the system, who can verify things. So let's go back to our employee. Uh, one employee is maintaining the cash records. The other employee is maintaining the cash physically. Uh, well, you can have a third uh, person, in this case, the assistant treasurer, who knows all that system and can do regular reports on anything that's what we call unreconcilable. Right. There are differences. Everyone, I mean, if you've been a cash right, a cashier, uh, if you've run a cashier, if you're a teller or anything like this, you'll know you there may be you may be over and short a little bit. You know, you might be off uh, several cents, several dollars, but nothing really fantastical, depending on how big the day is. But you need someone to go ahead and and have that you know verified. So the if it's big enough, you'll have an internal verifier that the process is working okay. That internal verifier is also the one to alert management that, hey, I found this discrepancy. We need to look into this. Um, human resources, yes, even human resources needs to get in on this, right? They, they play something. How are human resources involved in stopping fraud? Lots of ways. Um, first, let's, let's tell, let me talk to you a little bit about um, about bonding employees. And this is, you know, we're not 50 shades here. Um, this is about insurance. Bonding is about insurance. Um, and you need to be insurable. When you get hired at a job, that's one of the reasons for a background check. Um, they want to make sure that you don't have a history of taking things that don't belong to you. They want to make sure that you can be trusted with the job in general. And most importantly, they want to make sure you can be insured. Because one of the first things they do when you go to work for them is they take out an insurance policy called a bond that protects them in case you screw up and take shit. Okay. It protects the company from that type of fraud. All right. So you might think you're getting away with something, but uh, you're, you're really not, right? Because the company has already thought all these things through and have protected themselves quite well against that. You go to jail, they, they don't lose a dime. Um, so a bonding is very important. So bonding, you know, an insurance company will not offer insurance on an employee who has a past of taking things, mostly. 
Um, and so if you were, you know, if, if your background check, basically, you know, the uh, criminal offender record, Corey, um, comes back showing you when found guilty of, you know, embezzlement or theft or anything that indicates that you've taken other people's stuff and you were found guilty of it, uh, you're probably not able to get bonded. You're probably not able to have insurance. And so they won't hire you um, for anything along those lines. Um, so that's really important <clears throat> to know to understand that, that human resources has a role in this and bonding employees is really about insurance for the, for the company. Another thing that companies will do is they'll do two things. They'll, they'll rotate jobs. So employees don't get not just bored at one particular job, but so bored that they think about taking stuff, <laughs> you know. Um, sort of the idle hands uh, is the devil's workshop type of mentality. It's like, well, if people are bored, you know, and uh, they might just take stuff and they start building excitement in their own lives in a wrong way, in a Kardashian way, which is not a, appropriate. So, you know, um, so they basically go ahead and rotate jobs, um, rotate people through various things, and they notice the differences. They notice the differences. That's also true with vacations. Vacations are also there. You think they might be being nice. Oh, they want me to take a vacation. Well, yes, they want to actually, they do want you to take a vacation because they want to see if anything changes when you're not there. <laughs> okay. So if you're on vacation and all of a sudden they notice some changes, then there might be a violation to be looking into. Okay. I hate to sound really cynical about it all, but you know, it's business. It's just something that you have to do to protect yourself. Um, and I think that's one of the most important things for you to sort of understand as well. Um, there are all these controls are in place uh, to protect the company against any fraudulent activity. Obviously, if you're just doing your job and you're, you're being as honest an employee as you can as a human being, you got nothing to worry about. But for those that, that have some issues with this and can get into trouble on occasion, um, that's what these things are here for. Okay, so you're gonna be looking at a lot of different situations that they call anatomy of a fraud. So this, this is what your homework is gonna be about as well. Uh, knowing what you know about the internal control procedures, can you identify which one would stop a fraud? Because it's sort of like, uh, you know, it's kind of like a crime show, uh, you know, but in accounting. Okay. So here we have um, Maureen Fergulli. I don't know why they name people here. You know, this, uh, this person was a training supervisor for claims processing at Colossal Healthcare. I'm just making that up. That's how I would say it. I was her spokesperson. So she ran a training program uh, for people who were working for the company. So what they did is she created fictitious healthcare claims. Okay. And these claims were sent to the accounts payable department for payment. Duh, how stupid. After the training class was over, she would normally notify the payable department that Oh yeah, uh, one, two, three, four, and five, those are fictitious. Those are part of my training. You know, don't pay them, don't pay them. However, Maureen was a little bit of a devil. She did not inform the accounts payable about every claim. <laughs> uh, some people. So she created some fictitious claims for entities that she actually controlled. In other words, she would get the payment and she would let accounts payable pay that claim, which would then come to her and she would put it into her fictitious company. Nice. She took $11 million. That's a colossal amount of money, if I would say so. Yeah. That's a lot, that's a whole lot. What would have stopped this? Okay, I'm not gonna call 
there's no Superman accountant, uh, you know, or Iron Man accountant, you know, that you're gonna be calling. Um, this company failed to establish responsibility in this way, right? They could have restricted the training supervisor for both creating the claim and approving a claim for accounts payable to pay. They should have also created a dummy system for training. Instead, they used the company's live system, which again, created an opportunity to grab the money, in which case she did. So colossal healthcare, colossal failure. Here's another one, Larry Fairbanks, Assistant VP, or Assistant Vice Chancellor at Aesop University. Um, he was allowed to make purchases under $2,500 for his department without approval from say the accountant or other people. Unfortunately, Larry liked shopping uh, to the point where he liked antiques and other collectibles. So he bought them for himself. <sighs> then he would create fake invoices that looked like regular invoices and were very consistent with all the other invoices that his department would process on a normal basis. And after all, he's the assistant vice chancellor, like assistant vice president, kind of knew the system. So he submitted these fake invoices to the accounting department and was able to get paid. Okay. Well, it took almost a half a million dollars, which is a lot of education to some students at that college. It's, uh, it's a lot, quite a lot. Uh, and again, the big missing control is Larry had uh, had the rights to do all of those types of things because there was no segregation of duties. He was allowed to order the items. He was allowed to receive the items. And then he was allowed to get the invoice, which is the document, right? So any one of these types of things, if they were broken up, someone else could have noticed that, hey, this, we didn't order this. Yeah. Um, so because everything was with with this guy, you know, uh, Larry was able to to do everything because he was the only one who knew. Okay, again, he had control over those documents, uh, and he and because of that, he could he could put in fake invoices because he had control of those documents. So not a good thing for. Uh, so this is another segregation of duties one, where I'm kind of skipping over it. Um, but again, this particular person was an accounts payable clerk for a construction company. And again, there was no segregation. She wrote the checks, right? Um, uh, she then write, uh, she actually was able to change the checks and then she did the bank reconciliation. So no one knew anything had happened to this check once it left, only she did. So again, um, uh, the segregation of duties because she had both physical custody and she was the one who had the record keeping. So she knew both sides, no one else knew what was going on until of course, after she, she left. And again, it's over half a million dollars. Uh, she probably has a very nice house now. Uh, here you had a, uh, a company called Mod Fashions. Uh, they had, uh, they sent employees like a lot of companies out for travel, go to this place, go to that place, et cetera. When employees travel, they often get reimbursed by submitting receipts for certain things. So in this case, the receipts could be uh, a detailed bill for a meal, for example, or a credit card receipt when that was made, 
or a copy of the credit card bill. Uh, there were a number of designers who traveled frequently and were friends, so they came up with a fraud scheme. This is called, this is what collusion is, by the way. Um, and basically, if they had a meal together, one person submitted the receipt. <laughs> the other person submitted the credit card receipt. And the third person submitted their credit card bill. So they would, instead of getting $200 for the meal, they would get 600 because all three of them would get three, 200 each. Uh, they were able to grab a, a, a lot, that's a lot of meals, right? That's a lot of meals, 75 grand. Um, that, that's a heck of, I mean, think about it, about how much Happy Meals that could buy. Uh, here we had a documentation breakdown uh, because they were accepting everything to get reimbursed. They should only accept the original receipt, no photocopies, no other types of things. Um, and also one thing that would have, would have killed this totally is they could have just given them the corporate credit card rather than having them use their personal credit cards and submit for reimbursement. The corporate cards clearly is they, they own it. So they see everything that happens on it. If there's any fraud that happened, they could have could have hit it early. Okay, so um, you're going to read all about these. You know, I'll, I don't really need, kind of need to go over every single one. Um, I'll go over the last one here uh, because this is a human resource one. You had two people, Ellen, who was a desk manager, and Josephine, who was the head of housekeeping, uh, who were best friends. Uh, they never took vacations. <laughs> never took vacations. Okay. Uh, and they frequently filled in for other employees who were out sick or couldn't make it. Okay. Um, so, you know, this basically showed up in one thing. They took almost $100,000 together. Uh, why? Well, because of missing controls for human resources. Uh, one thing, they didn't do a background check. Uh, that desk manager had been fired by previous employer uh, for this type of behavior. Okay. Um, and thus, you know, if she never took sick, the fraud was only detected because Ellen was really, really badly sick. Um, and thus they were able to see something was going on. So again, very important to understand that all of these uh, rules and regulations are there to help, really, really help. Okay. Of course, there are limitations to creating internal controls um, at any business. Uh, there's supposed to be a benefit to the company to stop fraud. Uh, but sometimes putting in place a lot of internal controls might cost more than they help. So the cost should not exceed the benefit. Uh, no matter what system you have in place, remember we're human. Uh, the human element, even on those that fix really great systems, uh, can fail. Right? Even the people who you think have superior moral um, things in life fall down. Right, they 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 make they make bad mistakes, right? So you know, there's that human element that yes, it's a it's a system. It might be a very good system, but it's not foolproof, and you have that human element. Uh, certainly, if the company is very large, internal controls are always worth it. Uh, as the company is smaller and smaller, uh, tarred. Uh, it's really, really hard to justify certain things. Uh, I keep thinking of family restaurants that might be, you know, um, I, I used to uh, go to, I, mean, I was married to a Chinese person in the past, and we always went to Chinese restaurants. Some were very large at several um, different locations, and it was all family-based, all family-based. 
I don't think they're going to be putting any internal controls in there, um, no matter how large that company was getting. And it was getting pretty large. Um, you know, sometimes the size uh, matters. Sometimes if it's run by certain people, they won't do it. Um, you know, they, they'll, they'll, that trust level when you have a bunch of family working with you sort of overrides a little bit of that internal control instinct. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Your do it exercises here revolve around which control activity was violated. And this is what your homework is gonna focus on as well. Um, so you have here a person who's responsible for reconciling the bank account and they make all the bank deposits is also the company's accountant, also keeping all the books. Ooh, man. That's ripe for uh, this accountant can can stuff some money if they if he or she wanted to. Uh, this treasurer received an award for distinguished service because he hadn't taken a vacation in thirty years. Danger, Will Robinson. Uh, in order to save money on order slips and reduce time spent keeping track of uh, order slips, the local bar restaurant did not buy pre-numbered documents, uh, that's going to cause a problem at some point. So documentation procedures would help that a lot. Uh, Learning Objective 2 just simply applies all of these things to cash. So there's absolutely nothing new here other than it's specific to cash. Why cash? Because cash is the most vulnerable, most vulnerable asset a company has. Think about it. You're walking down, maybe you're, we're back in school. You're walking down the hallway, you look down, it's a $20 bill. You pick it up and ask whose $20 bill is this? You're going to have like 10 people say it's theirs, right? Um, usually just put it in your pocket, right? Because it's a, it's a bare instrument. If you have it in your hand, you're assumed to have owned it because it's cash. Well, that's what a lot of businesses go through when companies trust their employees to handle cash, <laughs> Right. It's a very vulnerable asset. Who's to say <laughs> it's not yours? <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it's one of those types of things. So it's really important, particularly for, for cash, that you have a strong control system so you can monitor all of that very well. So whether it's, you know, over-the-counter receipts here um, that's listed <clears throat> to, you know, having two people open all the mail receipts, all checks to be just listed, stamped for deposit only. Uh, anything that's gonna help control the loss of, uh, of any cash. Or when cash is going out, a disbursement, you know, you definitely wanna have some type of voucher uh, system. You wanna make sure everything is documented uh, going out. You wanna make sure there's responsibility involved. Uh, that's basically all this is, is uh, talking about. But I will highlight this one thing in objective two is how employees actually steal. Okay. <clears throat> so basically fraud is usually um, one of three types. One is what, we, what they call very nicely asset misappropriation. <laughs> Your honor. <laughs> Not guilty. I don't even know what asset misappropriation means, Your Honor. Uh, well, it means basically you took stuff, right? You took an asset that, that belonged to the company as your own. So uh, it is the most common fraud that's around, um, unfortunately. But it is, it, it is the least costly, believe it or not, for, for employers. Um, <clears throat> the most costly one is the third one, financial statement fraud. Um, it doesn't happen as often, uh, but when it does happen, it create it could bring a company down. This is what happened with Enron and WorldCom back in the day. Um, of course, they, the the one stuck in the middle here is good old fashioned corruption. It's been around since since we started walking on two legs, um, right? It, it is what it is: bribery, you know, extortion, all types of wonderful stuff like that. Fun, fun stuff. But again, the most common taken employees take stuff that's not theirs. Uh, the most costly is financial statements fraud, which is why Sarbanes actually had to get done. Okay. 
So in terms of the, uh, the median loss as listed here, uh, $130,000 for asset, that's the median. Remember the median is the middle number. If you listed all of the numbers from small to large, the one right in the middle is the median. So the median is 130. And again, most of the fraud happens there. However, even though this is less likely, it's the most costly. Okay, and then basically that's, that's basically it. More, more fraud to be analyzed and, and looked at. Um, there is, by the way, a great field of accounting that combines criminal justice and accounting, and that's forensic accounting, forensic accounting. Um, basically, uh, looking at financial crimes, you have to understand the finances and be able to identify those types of things. So uh, fascinating stuff. Maybe some of you might be interested in it. I don't know, but I figured I mentioned it. Um, how'd you do? Any questions? <laughs>